Hi, everyone. Today, let's talk about Fundrise. We'll start off by going through the 2020 year-end investor letter. We'll go over the news feed and some of the interesting information that's in there. And of course, we'll go over the returns for the year. If you like investing and making money, definitely like and subscribe. I make videos like this almost every day, so make sure you hit the bell so you don't miss out on any future episodes. Welcome to the Portfolio Bulletin. Let's get started. So 2022 year-end investor letter. Their performance was strong, but they did actually take some losses for the first time in quite a while. They say throughout 2022, they delivered strong returns, especially in comparison to the stock market and publicly listed REITs. They say the bond market produced some of the worst returns on a 12-month rolling period from October of 21 to October of 22. And this is definitely something we talk about in my videos regularly, looking at TLT falling from about $170 down to $95 in that range. Pretty tough returns in the bond market, obviously with inflation and the Fed raising rates is going to be heavy on those markets. Fundrise obviously was able to outperform those markets and did pretty well on the year, even though they lost a little bit of money on some funds. And then they go into the returns of Fundrise compared to the S&P 500 and public REITs. You can see Fundrise dividends for income, 2.17%. Public REITs did return a little bit more dividends and the S&P 500 returned less. And then the bond aggregate at about 2.5%. So dividends pretty much in that range, slightly better than overall stocks, slightly worse than public REITs. Appreciation down a little bit more than half a percent. And this is where they really outperform. Public REITs were down more than a quarter, 27.87%. Huge negative returns, minus 25% if you factor in dividends, compared to Fundrise at a positive 1.5%. Public stocks down 18.11% if you factor in dividends and depreciation. And then you have the bond market down about 12% on the year. Again, all of these underperforming Fundrise pretty significantly. Fundrise had positive returns on the year, whereas everything else was down last year. They say these numbers factor in the 385,000 plus accounts that Fundrise has. This number continues to rise. Fundrise is a big platform and it's becoming bigger every day. And if you're not invested with Fundrise, I do really like this platform and I've had good returns. Obviously, this year was a little bit tougher year for them. But like we see here, they did do better than basically everything else. Looking at their returns based on your years investing with them across the different types of account, income, balanced and growth. You can see if you've been with them longer, you obviously have had good returns. Less than one year, you might have some losses. One to two years, probably pretty flat. And anything more than that, you are definitely in the green, showing that this is a long-term investing style. And you definitely need to be aware of that if you are going to invest with them. Going into realistic does not mean pessimistic. Fundrise and their CEO are notoriously conservative. This is very good for the platform, obviously has worked out well in the recent market. They understood that the end of 2021 into 2022 was going to be tough. They talked about that in their 2021 year investor letter, which I did talk about around that time that it was released. They were concerned that inflation was going to be ongoing and that rates were going to be going higher, which all happened. And they positioned themselves pretty well, as you can see with their results versus everything else. They mentioned here they thought the credit market was wrong and that interest rates were too low. And we saw that come to fruition throughout the year. And they say as a result, they built their portfolio to withstand the new norm based on what they thought was going to happen. They invested in very high quality real estate in the Sunbelt region, which has been doing very well and is resilient to the inflationary environment and so far has done quite well. They continue to lower their leverage, being at a much lower leverage rate compared to public REITs. And this is stuff that they do talk about in their podcast as well. If you are a Fundrise investor, I do suggest that you listen to their podcast. It is with the CEO and he talks directly about his investing strategy and how he's really leading the company. Pretty interesting and good to know what his thoughts are on the economic conditions and what he's doing with Fundrise to make sure that we get good returns. They say, despite all of the negative information that they've had here recently, they are starting to be a little bit more optimistic. They expect within the next 12 plus months that there will be some interesting investment opportunities and that they plan to capitalize on these to the best of their abilities. They also mentioned don't fight the Fed. They know that Feds are going to stay high and they put the dot plot in here from the Fed showing where rates are going to be. They expect them to get just above 5%, which is what the Fed is forecasting, and that they're going to stay there basically throughout 2023. 
Bond market doesn't quite believe that. They do believe that there's going to be some cuts represented here by the dark dots fading into the end of 23 and slowing down back to that 3% more normalized rate in 25 and 26. But currently, the yellow dots here is what the Fed is saying they're going to do. They say based on this information, they plan to see an economic slowdown, and they're going to use this time to build up their liquidity, which has also led to a sharp decline in asset values, which is part of why the fund saw some net asset value decreases. We'll talk about that when we get to the asset funds and some of the losses this year. And then they say here in the middle, they did see some losses and no asset is going to be immune to all market conditions. The quantitative tightening that we've seen has affected the overall markets. The quote unquote risk free rate from the Fed has decreased the value of all assets. And that's definitely something that's being factored into the value of these funds. They mention here that opportunity favors the prepared. They're starting to build up liquidity. And they plan to take advantage of some of the things that are going to be available. Like they mentioned before, they expect good opportunities in the real estate space. As the market starts to bottom out, they're going to take advantage of some of these. And this is where they think they are in the market cycle. You can see Fed rates hike, yield curve inverts. You take advantage of opportunities throughout the year. And then as we get through 2024, they expect the FOMC to decrease rates. And that during this period of adversity, that's where there's going to be opportunity. They say looking at stability, they do expect inflation to decline through 2023 and that their properties will stay resilient and generate positive income growth. They do expect the areas where they are investing the most to grow in terms of population by more than a million to 1.25 million in that time. They show the growth rates here in the areas that they are investing, which obviously leads to real estate values going higher in those areas. More people means more demand for housing and rent which does benefit the investors that are investing in those areas. And like they mentioned here, 70% of acquisitions from 21 to 22 were in these areas, with more than 90% in the Sunbelt area. Moving over to opportunity, they expect the great deleveraging to happen. They say people are going to have liquidity constraints. Borrowing will turn down. There won't be as much money. And that gives us time to prepare. And that goes into the market cycle. So we're in that recessionary, transitionary period. They say winter of 22 through 23, where there's going to be opportunity to start buying properties. And then into mid-23, probably realistically into 24, that's where you're going to be in the more offensive period. And then there'll be that period of expansion following that offensive investing environment. Looking at temperament, they say there's no such thing as perfect timing. Try to buy when there's blood in the streets and fear versus when people are greedy. Pretty classic stuff. Very Warren Buffett-esque. And then looking at appendices here, they talk about the amount of money growing in these funds. Since launch date, they've put quite a bit of money into the flagship real estate fund. Net total return on that is minus almost 5%. And everything else that's mature is basically positive, except for growth rate 7, pretty negative here. Development E-REIT, also slightly negative at 1.5% down. And then all the balanced REIT and income REITs were positive on the year. Besides the balanced E-REIT 2, slightly negative, and then income, all positive, as you would expect. And then they talk about the amount of money that's in each of the types of property. You can see multifamily apartments make the biggest value, single family homes second, basically at the same value. And then everything else is slightly ancillary, industrial quite high at almost a quarter billion, mixed use commercial 161 million, and then other at about 50 million. So total assets just over $2 billion, which is pretty awesome. And then real estate backed fixed income. This is bond investing, multifamily homes sitting at the highest. Acquisition and development sitting at the highest at almost a quarter billion. Multifamily homes second here at $214 billion. Senior loans and residential mortgages here at about $140 billion total. And then altogether, $2.6 billion in assets on the books at the end of 2022. Moving over to newsfeed, I want to talk about this just for a moment. You have the 2022 Year Investor Letter. We also have Onward, their podcast. They continue to put out new episodes of this. They've put out, I think, 14 so far, which is great. Talk about performance updates in the investor letter. And then dividends. My dividends here for the Q4 were $132, and that already got reinvested, which is good to see. And then they talk about more onward as they continue to put out good information about Fundrise. And then they have the Innovation Fund, which you can invest in. And then their first Innovation Fund investment with Vanta. I'll probably do another video more in depth on Vanta. I do have to learn more about what it is, but that's information for another time. Moving over to my returns here, you can see my overall portfolio is currently at 63000 Pretty good amount of money. This is a substantial amount of my overall portfolio here. 
you can see my net returns are almost $10,000. So pretty good to see you have the gray line on what I put in versus the green line, which is what it's worth if I were to redeem it right now. And you can see most of that is appreciation because I am in the growth fund. So almost 7,000 of that is appreciation and about 3,000 dividends and then minus about $100 in advisory fees. That's over the course of my entire time with them. You can see I started investing back in May of 2019. And over that time, I've only paid $100 in advisory fees, not a huge amount relative to the amount of money that I do have invested with them. You can see my portfolio is about 75% real estate with them versus 25% growth equity. That's broken up into the Fundrise IPO, so shares in Fundrise, plus their innovation fund, which is their venture capital fund. Not a huge amount of money there for me, just $5,000. And that has not seen any kind of returns quite yet. And then the Fundrise IPO, I invested a little bit more than $10,000. And they're saying that that's worth about $16,600 right now. And then looking at the real estate here, you can see that's most of the gains with that almost $10,000 return. Looking at the returns year to date for 2022, you can see took a couple of losses here on the East Coast REIT in Q3 and Q4, but net positive on the year. Fundrise E-Fund, slightly negative on the year. The big one was the flagship fund, minus 5.6% on the year and minus 7.4% in Q4. And then the Fundrise E-REIT 7, minus 5.5%. This is a very small holding for me, so it didn't represent a lot of cash loss. Biggest one was obviously the Fundrise Real Estate E-Fund. And let's switch those over to dollars here. You can see that was minus $671 on that fund. Only $61 here in Growth Rate 7, almost $30 here in Development e -REIT, and then almost $17 here on the Fundrise eFund. And then they show a couple of things where they added together a couple of funds in mergers, and then my total returns for the year at $1,100. Again, significantly better than the public REITs or the stock market, but still a couple of losses overall on the year for some funds. Finishing up here with my goals for this account, I do want to get it to the premium level. It does take $100,000 to get to that level. So I need $47,000 left to go. I continue to add money to this every single month, and I'm sure it'll get closer and closer until we get to that point. But right now, that is my goal. And you can go in here and see your individual goals as well. My current overall goal is just over half a million dollars by 2041. And currently, I'm on track to do that. They mention it here, contributing about $650 every single month. If you're not invested with Fundrise, definitely check out the description and use my personal link to join Fundrise. Surprisingly, none of you have done this yet. I've had a couple of people use invitations on other investment platforms, but surprisingly, Fundrise has not had any of those. You do get $50 free dollars if you use this link and it gets your Fundrise portfolio started. Let me know down in the comments section what you think of Fundrise. Are they going to continue to outperform or are they going to generally be flat from here? Are you already an investor with Fundrise and what do you think of their returns compared to basically every other asset in the markets here today? Definitely like and subscribe if you got any value out of this video and make sure you hit the bell so you don't miss out on any future episodes. Of course, none of this is financial advice. This is all for entertainment purposes. Good luck in your investing and have a great day.